Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the 36th Annual College of Business Technology Outlet Conference. Another couple of areas of great concern are interest rates and inflation. And if you're contemplating buying anything big, they're, they're weighing heavily on your mind. Um, Dr. Dennis Foster is going to speak to us about that. Uh, Dennis has his uh, BA from Drake University, both MA and PhDs from the University of Hawaii. He, he's been here at NAU since 1990 teaching courses in business and economics. Uh, his main uh, research interest lies in the impact, the economic impacts of public policy decisions. And so Dennis is going to try to give us some clarity on interest rates and inflation. Uh, once again, it's a pleasure to speak to you on the topic of interest rates, inflation, and the general condition of our economy. Uh, as I am sure it is true of uh, the other presenters tonight, most of my remarks, in fact, uh, perhaps all of my remarks, have absolutely nothing to do with the presidential election. Uh, the economy is what it is, and the uh, outcome of the election wasn't really going to change any of that. Still, I can note that our long national nightmare is over failed policies that led to a debt crisis and nearly wrecked production have been overcome. And opening this Friday is the new James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> entertainment, uh, for quite a few years now, Elliot and Ron and I have been playing pretty much the same sad tune about the state of the economy. So much so, in fact, that we decided it might be kind of fun to actually form a blues band. And so we have. I guess I should use this. To the right. The one on the right. Our group is called The Fiscal Cliff. <laughs> We mostly sing songs of misery and woe. For your dining and dancing pleasure, we're now playing in the sequestration lounge. <laughs> Nightly at 9 and 11. Catch us if you can. Here's an overview of what I want to talk about this morning. We'll take a look at the current state of the economy, then we'll look at our recovery and compare it to past recoveries. Uh, we'll take a look at the mechanism of inflation and how interest rates are used to affect the economy. I'd like to reconsider some aspects of the Great Depression and look at some lessons that may be applied to our current situation. Finally, I'll give you my specific economic outlook. So let's start by looking at some statistics showing our current situation. This chart shows economic growth, real GDP, that's occurred in each quarter since 2000, expressed on an annual basis. The red line shows zero economic growth, and you can see the last two recessions are marked here, 2001 and 2008. And you can note the severity of this last downturn. One of our current problems is that average growth since our depression, since our recession, has been quite, uh, quite low and quite sluggish. From 2001 on, the average growth was about 2.6% per quarter in uh, the uh, quarter since 2008 has been only 2.1 percent. So this is not very high, in fact not expected. We expect it to be uh, much better and it's having only a very, very minuscule effect on our standard of living. This chart shows the aggregate economic growth over 13 quarters and is plotted for each of the last four recessions. They each start at the trough of their recession and you can see the dramatic gains that were made during the uh, following the 1981-82 recession, which is the top line uh, under President Reagan. The other three recoveries are all pretty close to each other. Uh, and our current recovery is the lowest line on that chart, so it's measuring the aggregate increase in output over the first 13 quarters of the recovery. Uh, so it doesn't seem like it's all that much out of the norm, but we should note that the current recession is oftentimes uh, uh, referred to as the worst one since the Great Depression. Certainly it's, it's, worse, it's the worst one since 1982, and it may be the worst one since the Great Depression, uh, and yet the recovery has been very uh, weak and very mild. The downturns in 1990 and 2000 were uh, much more muted, uh, and consequently the recoveries were, were much flatter. Uh, 
And unfortunately, the current recovery is looking very much more like those. Here we can track the uh, progress of unemployment across these past four recessions. Uh, for each of the uh, recessions that I've got, let's go back a little bit. For each of the recessions that I've got, I'm going to start at 5.6% so that we can compare uh, results. Uh, we'll start with the 1981 recession, which uh, actually uh, goes back to the 1979 recession because uh, the unemployment rates were actually quite a bit higher at the start of the 1981 uh, downturn. <coughs> So uh, what you see there in the chart is unemployment rising uh, for the 1979 recession, uh, then it uh, falls a little bit, we had our shortest and mildest recovery ever, and then we went into the 1981 recession uh, with full force. Uh, when you hear people talk about the double dip recession, they're talking about this historical uh, example. Now you can see that the unemployment rate maxed out a little bit below 11%. And then with the recovery, that rate fell quite sharply for about a year and a half. But even then, while the economy was growing quite strongly, the unemployment rate uh, took a long, long time to uh, work its way back down to 5.6%. Uh, all told, it was over eight years that the unemployment rate was above 5.6%. Here's the recession from 1990. Uh, and you can see that uh, we had a full recovery in terms of the unemployment rate about two years after the uh, improvement began. Here's the recession from 2000, 2001, uh, and it's hardly noticeable in the unemployment data. It was a very shallow recession, and the recovery was pretty quick once the improvement began. And then here's our current recession. You can see that the rise in the unemployment rate was rather quick, uh, and the decline has been excruciatingly slow. Uh, indeed, if you look at that line, it looks like it's going to converge with the 1981 line, which bodes real ill in terms of how long it's going to take to get unemployment back down to 6% uh, or 5.5%. Still likely to be many, many years. Putting all this together, we have quite a puzzle. With the severe recession, we expect a rather robust recovery. That is, we have lots of idle resources around. We have lots of labor, machines, buildings, tools, and Seemingly, if we can promote some activity, then it should be rather easy to get these resources back together, producing goods and services. Well, that's the theory. That was the justification for the huge fiscal stimulus of a couple of years ago. Indeed, I'm sure that plenty of, that, that plenty of you have heard of references to uh, how that stimulus was going to jumpstart the economy. Well, that hasn't happened. We've had the slowest recovery since World War II, even though, as I mentioned, many people consider this to be the worst recession since then. So why hasn't that happened? Well, I've got a story that I'm going to tell you a little bit later for you to consider uh, in this particular regard. But first, let's turn to the issues of inflation and interest rates. This chart shows the 12-month moving average of inflation measured by consumer prices going back to 2000. The gray shaded bars on the graph are the contraction phase of the recession. Uh, this is a standard feature in the charts that are generated from the FRED database maintained by the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, of which I have grown quite fond of using. Uh, you can see that inflation drops during recessions, so during the, where the gray bars are. In the last recession, you can see that the line actually dips below the, uh, into the negative region, which is where the red line is at zero inflation. Uh, in, indicating that we actually have deflation for a short period or falling prices. Since our recovery began, inflation has crept back up. Uh, it's bounced around a little bit. Currently, it's running at about 2% over the last 12 months. And the Fed is certainly not acting as if that's an imminent threat uh, to the economy. And while it's not a problem right now, uh, there have been actions by the Fed that are extremely troubling. And I think that uh, need to have uh, some attention paid to them if we're going to understand where the economy is going to move in the future. So let's take a closer look at what drives inflation. The first thing to note about inflation is nicely summed up in this famous statement made by Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. And that is, quote, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That's such an important concept 
that I always ask my money and banking students to explain it on their final exam. In fact, there are a few students here today, so I hope they're paying attention. <laughs> Since every monetary system is invariably controlled by the government, we can rephrase this as government causes inflation, period. If inflation exists, it was created by the government insofar as monetary policy goes. So how does this work? Well, the Federal Reserve directly controls something called the monetary base. The monetary base is made up of currency held in bank vaults, currency held by the public, and bank deposits held at the Federal Reserve. And what's happened to the monetary base over the last few years? Well, this chart shows uh, what's been going on since 1990. You can see that there is a slow steady increase in the monetary base up until about 2009. Then all hell breaks loose, starting with the meltdown in financial markets. The Treasury began its TARP program in late 2008. By late 2009, the Fed was pumping liquidity into the banking system, increasing the monetary base like crazy. Since then, the monetary base has increased by some $1.8 trillion, or over 200%. Now, the way this works is the Fed buys stuff with the monetary base. That's how it appears in the financial records. And here's what they've been buying. Traditionally, they buy treasury securities in order to pump up the monetary base. And over the last few years, they have done this to the tune of some $865 billion nearly doubling their total holdings of treasury securities. The other asset they've been buying is mortgage-backed securities. Up until a couple of years ago, this item didn't even show up on the Fed's balance sheet. Today, it's the second largest item on their asset side, uh, to, uh, coming in at about $850 billion. A few weeks ago, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke held a press conference following the meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. And he announced the Fed policy for the foreseeable future is to buy $40 billion in mortgage-backed securities per month until the labor market shows some improvement. At the uh, press conference, he was uh, pestered with questions about what that meant. And as usual, for Fed chairman, he was not very responsive. <laughs> we'll know it when we see it. And so where did all this money go? Well, banks are holding another $10 billion of currency in their vaults. The public is holding another $300 billion of currency, and bank deposits with the Fed, which are part of their reserves, are up about $1.5 trillion. Now let's fit these pieces together. Banking 101, how to make money. At least half the people in this room probably know this story. First, the Fed takes action to raise the level of bank reserves which are held as deposits at the Federal Reserve. They've been doing this for a while, as I mentioned, by buying U.S. Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Second, banks are presumed to have a profit motive, and they're going to seek to lend out these funds in order to earn an interest income. Up until 2008, that was a pretty clear mechanism. Uh, but then the Fed started paying banks interest on their excess reserves, and currently they're paying a quarter of a percent. Third, as banks lend these uh, monies out and expand credit, this will raise deposits in their banks. That is, the money that's lent is then spent and redeposited into uh, bank accounts that we're familiar with, checking accounts and savings accounts. Presumably, credit will expand until all of these excess reserves are now going to be counted as required reserves and no more lending can be done. And then finally, the measured money supply will rise. The money supply will include the value of our checking and savings accounts, and over the last few years, since 2009, the money measure, MZM, has gone up by some 17.5%. Now that's a pretty simple story, but there's still something wrong with this picture. The financial system has taken in and is sitting on $1.5 trillion of excess reserves. Their trepidation about expanding credit is mitigating the effect on the measured money supply and, by extension, on inflation. So right now, inflation is low, but there's no saying how long that's going to remain because of all these excess reserves that are sitting out there. 
So what does the Federal Reserve want? Well, they want a strong and healthy economy. Uh, presumably they're going to engage in policies to do that. Their policies will be tempered somewhat by their fears of inflation. Right now, inflation is very low. They don't seem very fearful. And so they've engaged in what we would describe as a very loose monetary policy. And by a loose policy, we mean increasing liquidity, pumping up bank reserves, lowering interest rates, and expanding credit. The idea is pretty straightforward. This should stimulate spending. This should stimulate production. This should stimulate employment. But as we've seen over the last couple of years, this hasn't really been very effective. And in fact, seems a little bit uh, more than contradictory. Uh, banks are certainly reluctant to lend in this environment. The Fed can uh, pump them full of reserves, but they can't make them lend the money out. Uh, there were a couple of uh, members of Congress a few years ago that were thinking of ways to try to force banks to do this. Uh, and luckily, they have encountered. Uh, but so far, banks still can decide whether they're going to lend their money out or not. And as long as the Fed's willing to pay a little bit for them to hang on to those excess reserves, they seem content to wait. Now, why is policy ineffective? Well, the rate of interest that's most under control by the Federal Reserve is called the federal funds rate. It's the rate that banks charge each other for very short-term loans, mostly just overnight. During a recession, the Fed will push U.S. Treasuries out, pump up bank reserves, or actually will purchase U.S. Treasuries, pump up bank reserves, and as bank reserves um, go up, that will push down the price of borrowing these reserves, which is what the federal funds, rate, federal funds rate of interest measures. To a greater or lesser extent, we expect other rates to fall. The prime rate, the rate on commercial borrowing, the consumer borrowing rate, all the way up to the mortgage rate of interest. On this chart, you can see that the Fed did exactly this during each of the last four recessions, pushed down the federal funds rate of interest. But each time, it had to push it down to new lower lows. And for this recession, they pushed the rate for all intents and purposes down to zero. And there's nowhere else to go. That means pumping up the monetary base isn't doing anything anymore. So instead, they've engaged in buying up mortgage-backed securities in an attempt to more directly affect long-term rates. And their operation twist from last year attempted to rearrange their balance sheet by dumping short-term treasuries and exchanging them for longer-term treasuries. I guess this policy must be working. Uh, in fact, I just refinanced my house at 2.5% over 15 years. And I'm pretty sure that somebody's going to lose money on this deal. And I'm also pretty sure that somebody is not me. Here you can see how interest rates tend to track each other and how the Fed's actions tend to have more influence at the short end of the market. Uh, the green line, if you can see that that's green, the one that looks more blocky, uh, is the federal funds rate going back to 2000. The red line shows the yield, uh, the interest return on 10-year U.S. Treasury securities. You can see where the long and short rates are very near each other. This was just before the recession of 2001 and 2008. The economy had been growing pretty well. The Fed pushed up short-term rates to try to uh, keep credit from expanding too quickly. Uh, their intent was to keep from triggering inflation. Well, we didn't get inflation, but we did get recessions both, <coughs> excuse me, both times. And then as soon as that happened, their policy turned around. You can see that they pushed those short-term rates uh, down with the recession, and then there's a gap between uh, that federal funds rate and that 10-year interest rate. The current rate of interest on the 10-year uh, bond is running at 1.72%, and the uh, federal funds rate is 0.14%, uh, so still pretty close to zero. If we add in some other interest rates here, you can see that they follow the same general pattern. The uh, prime rate of interest is basically the federal funds rate plus a few percentage points. The 30-year mortgage bond uh, is a few, or actually is a 30-year mortgage rate is a uh, percent or two above what that 10 rate was. So what's the policy dilemma here? Well, for a couple of years, I've been telling you that the worst of all possible worlds for us is robust economic growth. It's probably not the thing you want to hear from economists. But I still stand by that today. 
If this happens, if we end up with a lot of economic growth, given the amount of liquidity that's sitting around in the banking system, it would not only trigger inflation, but if unchecked, could actually send us into a period of hyperinflation. That is, under good economic times, banks are going to be more eager to lend this enormous volume of excess reserves out to uh, potential customers. Well, I don't think that's really going to happen. Uh, I think that the Fed will jump in to make sure that it doesn't uh, occur. But what are they going to do? Well, they're going to take liquidity out of the system. They're going to raise interest rates. And they're going to hope that that doesn't spark a recession. Now, I think that hope is likely to be short-lived. And that will end up with exactly that problem. We'll end up with a recession. And I think uh, we'll end up with an even worse recession than the one we've just had. I'm afraid our best hope still lies in years of slow, sluggish economic growth. Fortunately, we have just the right president for that. <laughs> and I, I <laughs> All right. So let's go back and think a little bit about the Great Depression. The contraction started in 1929, ended in 1933. But the recovery was quite awful right up until the entry, our entry into World War II in late 1941. And why was that? Well, economist, e economic historian Robert Higgs coined the term regime uncertainty to explain the unbelievable duration of the Great Depression. This problem is well described by another economic historian, Gene Smiley, as follows, quote, from 1935 on, the New Deal ravaged the confidence of businessmen. As they became less and less certain that private property rights and their capital and its income stream would be protected and maintained, in other words, uncertain about the continuation of the current regime of private property rights, they became less and less willing to make investments, especially longer-term investments in structures and long-lived machinery. Increasingly, only short-term investments with quick payoffs were viewed as desirable. Threats to private property may come in many sources, including tax increases, new taxes, confiscation of private property, and business regulation that reduces an owner's rights over property. The list of congressional acts that weakened or threatened to weaken private property rights between 1933 and 1940 is lengthy. The NRA's goal was to fertilize American industry and reduce the ability of independent firms to decide on prices, production, and investment. The NRA and then the Wagner Act circumscribed businesses' ability to choose whom to employ and how much to pay. The right to own gold for monetary purposes was prohibited and gold clauses in contracts were outlawed. In the coal and crude oil industries, antitrust laws were suspended so that governments could impose quotas on producers to control the markets. The Tennessee Valley Authority inserted the federal government into the generation of electricity in competition with private utilities. And utilities were told that the TVA would become the yardstick by which private utilities would be measured and regulated. Regulation of interstate trucking, interstate busing, and oil pipelines all appear in the 1930s, and the regulation of radio and airlines was tightened. Tax increases in 1935, 1936, and 1937 were intended to soak the rich, and numerous new taxes on businesses were imposed. This regime uncertainty hampered private sector investment, which in turn hampers economic growth. From 1929 to 1933, investment fell from 16% of GDP to 2% of GDP. It rose thereafter, but was constantly buffeted by government actions. In 1936, it had risen back to 13% of GDP, and then in the ensuing recession, it fell back to 8%. By, by 1941, it had only risen back to 14% of GDP. So do we see signs of this today? The answer is yes, albeit not at nearly the dramatic levels that we saw during the Great Depression. First, some data on personal consumption. Uh, you can see again the recession uh, bars that are shaded in. Uh, personal re uh, consumption has recovered from the recession. You can see the dip that begins in the fourth quarter of 2007. By the fourth quarter of 2010, uh, that's over. And the last number that we have from the third quarter of 2012 shows some growth, and it looks like we're on a growth path that is 
sort of typical, usual for consumption. So the other part of the story is investment. And therein lies the problem. Here is the real gross uh, private uh, investment going back to 1990. And you can see that there's a lot of erratic uh, behavior there. Uh, and you can see the downturn during the last couple of recessions. The current level of real investment is 1.9 trillion, well below the peak in 2006, or 2.26 trillion. In fact, if you look at what we're, where we are today, <coughs> This is the same rate of investment that we had in 2000. So to think that our economy can grow when we're investing as much as we were investing 12, 13 years ago, well, those pieces do not fit together. And that explains, I think, pretty well why we're not growing very fast. But that's a good thing. So what else can we say about regime uncertainty today? Well, there's a lot you could go into in terms of this topic. I'll leave you with just a little taste of it, which is the fiscal cliff scenario that you've heard a little bit about earlier today and probably have read about. Here are some of the details of that fiscal cliff. The uh, expiration of the Bush tax cuts, expanding the alternative minimum tax, reducing Medicare reimbursements, there's sequestration spending cuts, the expiration of some unemployment compensation and some taxes kicking. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated the effects of this fiscal cliff will, in fact, reduce the deficit, and they also think it will cause a recession in the spring, leading to a 3% decline in real GDP and the loss of some 2 million jobs. Now, this may or may not actually happen, and that's almost beside the point, because the real point is that the economic landscape is so muddy, is so confused, I don't know how anybody can make rational business decisions in this environment. Uh, of course, business turns out to be very resilient, uh, bounces back pretty well, and that is to our great fortune. So, what is my outlook? Pretty grim, I'm sure you understand. I think interest rates will stay low. The Federal Reserve says they're committed to keeping these rates low through 2014, you know, unless things change. Of course, that's likely to be true, but that's also a sign that they don't think the economy is going to come roaring back anytime soon either. Even though the data is not showing any inflation, I think it's still a looming danger. The problem is once it starts, is it just going to catch fire and be impossible to stop? You know, it's not the kind of thing that usually kind of creeps up on you. So that's going to be, the, I think, the big fear there. Unemployment is likely to improve, but not in any dramatic fashion. Even the best case scenario is still pretty bleak. Uh, President Obama, I mean, based on the, the, the past, the, the record of the past in terms of unemployment, President Obama will be out of office before the unemployment rate comes down to 5.6%. So it's still going to be uh, quite a few years. And finally, I think our recession worries aren't over. I think that uh, we could face this problem. I think Ron thinks that the fiscal cliff problems are going to be solved by our uh, politicians. I don't give them as much uh, credence, uh, credence, but uh, I still think there's a lot of uh, issues of regime uncertainty here that are likely to dampen inflation and uh, may well pull us into a recession again. All right, I'm going to close tonight with my top 10 list. Today's top 10 list, a little bit different than usual. These are the uh, top 10 songs on the Fiscal Cliffs playlist. You can hear us at 9 and 11 in the sequestration lounge. Although I must mention that Dr. Cool, AKA Elliot, tends to nod off a little bit during that second set. So, <laughs> you want to hear the drum solos come to the 9 o'clock set. All right, so here's our top 10 playlist. Number 10. Rainy days and T-bills getting down. <laughs> Number nine, give me some money and take my house. Yes. Number eight, one bourbon, some tarp, more fear. <laughs> Number seven, I've got them insufficient stimulus blues. Number six, QE2 is over and the thrill is gone. Number five, your green jobs ain't feeding my kids. Number four, where you been, misery index blues. Number three, 47% seems too low. 
Number five, add to the bond. And then number one song in the Fiscal Cliffs playlist, You Broke My Heart, My Fanny. Thank you for your time.